Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, with me today is uh, Rob Hirschfeld, who is um, uh, with us on this podcast all the time. Uh, good day, Rob. How are you? Oh, well, it looks like Rob has... Um, I'm here. There he goes. I'm here. Okay. Well, it's good to hear from you, Rob. And um, today we start a series of new podcasts with some guests that, um, you know, some people I've met in my past career who... Um, will offer us a rather unique per, uh, perspective. And I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Will Venters, who is at the London School of Economics. And, uh, you know, uh, Will, thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Great. Can you just give us real quick an overview of uh, your role at the school? And uh, so, so our listeners get a feel for um, what you work on. Okay, hi. I'm in the Department of Management at the LSE, so we generally research broad management areas, but I'm in a very distinctive group called the Information Systems and Innovation Group, where we really focus on digital innovation and how technology gets used in real business. Um, and we've been studying that for a long time, way before my time. Um, and it's quite distinctive in that we bring social science and management science, but also technology together to try to study real problems. Um, and my particular interest is very much in digital innovation. So I'm a, I'm a computer scientist originally by training, my, that's my degree. And then I worked in industry and realized that actually getting systems to work often involved understanding people. And that led me into a, a, a PhD and then ultimately into my faculty position here. Um, and I teach a master's course in digital innovation along with some undergraduates. Um, and we're really looking at um, how do you build systems that really work? And for the last, I guess, five to eight years, I've been looking at broadly the, the, the change to large scale systems that extend beyond a kind of traditional organizational boundary. And that's, I think, how we got to know each other, because I've researched a lot in cloud computing, sure. where we look at technology moving outside the organization. And we would need to make sense of that. And I've been working in around cloud. I've been doing some interesting talks with organizations recently around things like AI. Um, and I'm looking particularly at digital um, interfaces. So how does, how does a build business work when it's connecting with other businesses or with other technology providers? And we, um, I wrote a book with a couple of colleagues called Moving to the Cloud Corporation. And I quite like that title because what we were really arguing, if you just take a second more is that the organize that cloud computing isn't so much about the internet being a cloud as much as blurring the edge of an organization. So what you're really doing is you're moving the technology outside, but you're really creating opportunities for new types of collaboration, new types of connection between businesses that such that it doesn't really make sense to draw organizations as square boxes anymore, but drawing them as a cloud sort of makes sense. Um, I guess a classic example of that is Netflix. It, you know, if you ask a, a management student, what is Netflix? They're kind of struggling beyond it's a brand because it's, it's AWS, you know, it's internet movie database. It's a content delivery network. It's your Samsung smart TV. It's the internet provider who provides it. And it's a load of glue that brings that lot together in a very clever way. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting questions about organizations and cloud that I'm really interested in. So I, I think one of the things that I like about your Netflix example and, and where, I, where I wanted to go first in, in, after your intro is Netflix in some ways is really defined by not knowing what they are. They're, it's, they're, it's a company that's really been innovating in a space where they're redefining the space, which is to me the definition of innovation. It's like, we're making it up as we go along, right? And they're, they're actually changing the very industries that, that they would have, you would have tried to bucket them into. Um, and, and as somebody who focuses on teaching innovation, which is, a, you know, it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> it, it feels to me like we've, we're changing the pace of innovation, that, that the technology here is, is actually redefining what innovation means. Is, is, that a, do you, is that a fair assessment of how things are going? I, I think so. I think there's a there's kind of two sides to it. I think you're right. You you hit on the fact that innovation's cumulative. You know, you can't invent one thing without the other. We couldn't have invented the internal combustion engine 
if we hadn't invented cogs and we hadn't worked out how fire works and we hadn't worked out how to drill holes in bits of metal and bash bits of metal. So innovation has always been generative, built on top of uh, uh, past technologies. What we've got today, though, is just this explosion in new generative fluid technologies of, of the Internet and uh, of digital technologies that allow us to sort of build stuff more easily and more quickly than before because we've got new tools that we can build them with and Netflix is a great example. I mean, uh, to build that kind of resource on top of AWS, you wouldn't have been able to do it without those kind of cloud services um, I, it, with ease. You wouldn't have been able to do it with, with ease. I mean, um, in a lot of ways, so it's, it's that generative stuff. But um, I still think there's a lot of old engineering that needs to happen. And I, I was at an event yesterday and I was absolutely petrified by hearing some guys from a big company talking about oh you know it's fine we um we just hack together a hackathon and then by the monday we've got a great piece of software and we install it in our corporate systems and we're running on the tuesday and it's like no there's a reason these software engineering textbooks are two inches thick there is some clever stuff that we need to do properly and agile for me was never about doing it super quick it was about doing it effectively efficiently with low risk but also quickly in a kind of bounded way, um, which would be really interesting to discuss. Cause, but I think you're oh, right. We, my goodness, we I, have, I, have a, I, have a, <laughs> I have a parking lot for us to talk about towards the end. I'll <laughs> offer this bait for the listener to stay on because I want to talk about the ha that hackathon experience and, and cargo cult, what I would call cargo cult innovation. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a teaser because I will come back okay. to it. I, I'm um, excited. I'm excited. That that one should be fun, but but I before we get there, um, this was this was our lunch rant over yesterday's uh, lunch actually for the team, uh, but you know we we had a podcast with with um, uh, one of the early cloud cloud people Dave McQuarrie the other day, and we were talking about um, how reducing the cost of infrastructure, the difficulty of acquiring it does accelerate the pace of innovation, that some of the things that we see coming, um, like your Netflix example, we don't even know what it, they mean yet. We don't even know, we were talking about Edge specifically, and um, and that was an amazing podcast, so people should definitely take time to listen to Dave talk about data gravity and the Edge and network latency and bandwidth, things like that. Plug for, plug for another podcast. But the, the sort of the, the end of that, we got to a point where all of these edge infrastructure, all these capabilities are reducing friction for new innovation that, that we, we can't, you know, as we make it better to have a multi-tenant infrastructure, so my, one of my definitions of cloud, it means that if I want to pr access a new market or access to data or access processing, my cost of entering that market has dropped dramatically from say creating a rail line. Um, so, if that's you know if that's spurring innovation does does that is that a measurable sort of effect in the innovative cycle time do you measure that uh, my kind of research I, I don't actually measure it but i've written about it and i think you know there's a number of reasons for that and there's a lot of stories associated with it but i mean the, the sheer scalability of of cloud the cost implications are, are, of being able to to spin up servers and virtualization for offered a lot of this, but, um, but cloud services allow you to spin up the production service and pay only pay as you go. I mean, this is the kind of classic mm -hmm. thing, but also, you know, you're not having to pay for all your testing rigs. You're not having to pay for all your development servers when you're not using them. You're not having to develop, pay for all those kind of back end side and the dust disaster recovery. You're only paying if you're actually needing it. The, the costs then come down and there's particular reasons as well that virtualization uh, offers w virtualization offered this opportunity to, to run multiple servers on one machine. But if you so-called statistically multiplex that, i.e. Amazon obviously needs an awful lot of servers in on black Friday, but it doesn't need them for January when everyone's skint after Christmas and hasn't got much money to spend. So it could hand those servers over to a, I don't know, a travel agent where maybe people book their holidays in January. And by sharing them out, it's like a power station, which runs, you know, different types of demand through the day and allows to share the cost out between them. 
So there's very good economic models of why that kind of multiplexing, which can only happen on a multi-tenanted cloud, um, can I reduce the cost for each user? Um, and they're pretty well understood. Um, and also you're not having to raise huge amounts of money up front to go and, you know, we used to write, sign a check and hand it over to Sun Microsystems to buy a big stack of machines, which you know was our startups. And then they would be great up until the point we went viral when they wouldn't be anywhere near enough and then everything would slow down. And this is a kind of old story of cloud that Animoto was the famous example. I'm just trying to remember the, the exact figures, but it span up to about two or 3,000 servers in a couple of days as a startup. But it was only paying for the demand. It was only paying as it went viral and users were actually using its service. You know, a few days later when it stopped being viral, it wasn't paying any more for those servers. So these are kind of well understood reasons why cloud can offer a huge cost saving. I think there's other savings as well. We could talk about the simplicity of, of managing a cloud estate compared to managing your own on premises or, or, um, or complicated hybrid estates, um, which would be interesting to get into. Because I think the cost of, of people is always, it's, it's easy to focus on the cost of the tin, but the cost of the people to manage the tin can be much more significant costs or interesting. The, the, thing, the thing that we were talking about with Edge, um, while I, I agree with you, the people are, are a big component of this, and I think we're adding dramatically to efficiencies that people can get by building on top of platforms and, and not having to reinvent development tools and, and all, a lot of the containerized work mm. that we see. Um, but in, in some of these new deployment models, access to new markets or access to an edge market because somebody else has deployed that infrastructure does matter. It's not a it's not the, the, the silicon that makes the difference. It's actually the geography. It's the real estate. Um, that if I can get into a global footprint market without having to buy any gear or rent land or anything like that, if I can just build it based on a CPU cycle, um, that is actually, a, you know, changes my access to markets, my ability to take a new idea and test it. Um, and a lot of those silently die behind the scenes, right? That's part of the, the cycle of innovation is being able to test things a lot faster that I don't, I don't have to. Um, I'll go back to the railroad analogy. I don't have to put, put a track between two cities that don't have a market to find out there's no market between the cities, right? I, I can, I can you know, do a trial balloon and let it die. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of that virtualization and these more general devices can help. I mean, the kind of phone is a tradition, is a kind of classic generalist device where we can push stuff out into, into that. You know, can you imagine the cost of rolling out um, an infrastructure like a, a accelerometer, camera, screen, et cetera, without the smartphone, you, you couldn't possibly do it. And that's why companies like Uber can rely on these smartphones to create incredibly complicated um, services. Um, right. Can you tell us a little bit more about Edge? I just want to understand, make sure that I'm understanding your definition of Edge. Um, for me, it's kind of that pushing out to the users and the local intelligence of the local devices. Is, is that how you're seeing it? I, I think I think that's a, a fine definition. I, I actually love to sort of dismiss the, the exercise of defining edge, which makes some people really mad. Um, <laughs> so my, my definition for edge is anything that's not cloud. So the, the way I see the world shaking out is that we have work that's going on in the major cloud providers, shared infrastructures, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if you're one of the others listening, but the end others. Um, I, I, have, I have a lot of friends at some of those others. Um, but the, the reality is those, the top three are defining how work is done mm -hmm. to a large extent. Um, and that definition sort of shapes how we build applications, how we test applications. It, it, it's, it's transformative of how work is, how we're thinking about building information technology and, and all of our life around that. Mm -hmm. And then what I, what I see, what, what I like to define edge, and I loved your, your saying cell phone is an edge device, because it is. Anything that do, isn't done inside the cloud doesn't have the advantage of all the services and capabilities that people use in the cloud and it forces anybody building outside of the cloud to accommodate that infrastructural challenge right and so that to me is the, the real question here is that we have a whole bunch of places that we're trying to work and then the cloud is um, 
you know, it, and basically as soon as you venture outside of that happy boundary of cloud, you've, you've now crossed into something I would call edge. Uh, and that includes IT data centers, <laughs> it includes, uh, you know, fields, it includes cell towers, um, the yeah. traditional edges, it would include an airplane flying in the sky, um, which is a, a flying data center or an yeah. autonomous car, which is a, you know, a data center on wheels now, um, you know, forward military bases, all sorts of, all sorts of interesting places. Um, and one of the things, one of the themes for us is that we see those today, those data, those infrastructures are basically islands of capability. They're, they're not general purpose use. They're, they're very tightly focused on, you know, running an airplane or driving a car. Mm. Uh, but the, the trend line that we see when you, you talk about 5G cell phone towers or factories or, you know, some municipal type computing is those are going to look a lot more like shared infrastructures that were used, you know, sort of that defined cloud in the early days. Yeah. Um, my, my problem is that they don't define cloud today. Uh, Amazon has hundreds, Amazon has hundreds of services uh, lined up um, that aren't available if you're out on the edge. Um, and then we have to accommodate that, that lack of service. Uh, so that, that has me rethinking uh, sort of the whole infrastructure. I'm interested to hear how, yeah. how you see that, that definition. I think it's really, it is interesting. And uh, the island analogies, it's just something I just read by been writing about a, a little bit. It's, it's spot on because in a sense, it's the lack of connection to the data that I think is the significant thing here. I don't think it's the cloud, it's the, it's the data. And if you look at things like self-driving cars, the, 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 the issue of a self-driving car is, um, in fact, it was a paper I wrote talked about equivalence that actually if you could do the processing equivalently in the cloud to doing it locally, you would do it in the cloud for very good reasons. You can't because of latency problems and communication problems. So obviously you have to do a portion of the processing in the car. What you really want to be able to do is to send the data into a pooled resource. You want your car to be able to share its driving characteristics to the other cars so we can all learn and we can get better cars. And for that, that's gonna be the cloud. So the two, to put any kind of barriers between them is, is to miss the point. And one of the things that I think is really going to be significant is things like you're talking about 5G, um, communication, high-speed communication with low latency that can can deal with those type of, of, of applications, the huge data, transfer requirements for supporting a self-driving car local data center with a massive cloud-based data center. Um, and I've got a research project with Huawei. Um, so I have spent some time sort of visiting some of their events and the, the move to 5G and some of the interesting support from 5G for allowing low, not low, not zero latency, but low latency, but very high bandwidth. Um, communication is really interesting. But another one that's really interesting is MBIOT. So um, there's a new communication standard that's emerging, um, which is designed for, na it's a uh, narrowband um, internet of things supporting network. And the aim of this is not massive um, bandwidth. This is low bandwidth, but this is, when you buy a, I don't know, an internet enabled washing machine, at the moment, you have to connect it to your Wi-Fi network, and most people just can't do that. They, they just, it's beyond their capability with a dial and a silly button to try to do it. I mean, you know, I've just got a Nest, and Nest is lovely user interface, but setting it on my sort of 25-digit Wi-Fi password was a pain in the neck. <laughs> MBIOT is a $5 chip that connects to a, a um, mobile phone mast. But what's really interesting about it is that it, the $5 chip requires very little electricity and will go through walls. It'll communicate through the ground. So for, you can put this in a water meter and it'll run for 10 years on a battery, communicating once a day through NBIOT to the base station, through the ground, through the walls, to wherever the base station is and report your water meters on a daily basis. Now, if you think about the edge cases where you could, where you start to think, well, it's not just gas meters, it's not just water meters, it's all those silly devices you buy on an IoT basis 
that at the moment we're trying to connect to our Wi-Fi and we're worried because they have crappy passwords and crappy security. Wouldn't you prefer to buy a washing machine where it never asked you for any of your security? That was done through the cloud and it had its own communication to the washing machine manufacturer. But then from a, another side of it, then the washing machine manufacturer could say, well, actually you're not buying a washing machine, you're buying a service. And we're gonna keep track of how you use it. And we're gonna say, you know, we're not covering that with a warranty because we saw you overstuffed it with 15 pairs of jeans on a <laughs> Wednesday afternoon. You, know, you start to see there is a big changes in the way we look at, at, at products. But I think, I think that's an interesting standard where we start to look at, at different types of networks, not just the kind of high end 5G, but also the low end. Um, very low power usage ones. I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's impossible to distinguish the interesting side of the technology where we, we have to deal with network and connectivity um, and then also patching and upgrade and you know, fixing, fixing those devices with the very interesting sociological components of, well, wait a second, now I, my, you know, I'm buying a device and the data on that device, my use of that device might not be owned by me or controlled by me or managed by me, right? That, that washing machine could have, you know, uh, for legitimate reasons, it could have speakers in it or, yeah. right, that, or microphones in it that monitor sound, ambient sound in the environment. And that, that, that information gets streamed back into headquarters from the washing machine. Um, yeah. Oh, and and well, if, don't we, yeah, if, Rob, don't, uh, don't we already have that with these devices from Amazon and Google that people put in their houses? I, I guess I'm, I must be out of my mind, but I won't buy one. <laughs> uh, they just sit and record your life, and those companies use the data about you to sell you things. I, yeah, maybe it's I, just Stephen, me. I'm, I'm sorry, but your cell phone's already doing that, whether you've bought an Echo or not, or uh, oh. or Google Home or uh, anything else. No, I didn't I buy any of it. Where we can decide on that. I'm, what worries me is the point at which it's no longer possible to decide because you can't buy anything. It's like it's either no washing machine or this washing machine. And we certainly know that with a phone. You can't buy a phone anymore that doesn't have a camera on it. You can't buy a phone that doesn't have kind of all round recording. So you're stuck a little bit. And you can't say I'm not going to join Google or Apple's ecosystem when you buy a phone. I mean, you are really yeah. spending a lot of money on a brick if you don't sign up to Google or Amazon when, or, or Apple when you buy one of their devices. So I think we're already there. Um, we're, we, we definitely are already there. I think, you know, it, uh, legislation, privacy laws, GD, you're, you're, you're in Europe, so GDPR is a reality, yeah. coming reality for you. Um, we did it, we had a, a show where we talked about GDPR pretty, pretty, pretty extensively. Um, there's a great um, paper, this, uh, a, a professor, I think she's at MIT Sloan, Susanna Zuboff, who wrote a paper that, and just the title of it captures a lot. She called it um, surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I just think that as a title kind of captures a lot of, of where we are with the, with some of these technologies. But yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, some of these, <laughs> these legislative changes are going to be needed to, 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 uh, to provide oversight with that. And, but at the same time, coming back to innovation, mm -hmm. the idea that I can combine multiple sources of data, a free flowing amount of, of data between these edge use cases translates into high degrees of usability, right? It might be that, you know, we're, uh, we're stuck on the washing machine example because we brought it up, but Sorry. the information provided by my washing machine correlated with my reading habits, correlated with, right, uh, who knows, information about my coworkers might translate into some actionable insight that I want, you know, my refrigerator to know. I don't, I don't know. Um, but this is the fun thing to me when we go back to what innovation means, right? Yeah. Uh, innovation means that you know, we, we might not actually fully appreciate what, how this information correlates yet. Um, and so, I, think it's really how, I mean, how does, how does, so, I mean, that's, how does, how does that translate into what you think about what you do or, or teach? So I think it's absolutely massive in the sense that, you know, data is the core resource in, in a, in a lot of this stuff. It's the, it's the, it's the kind of center of value. Um, and data is also 
cumulative, generative. You put data together, you find new things. So a lot of this, this new change will be around integrating data sources because you know if your washing machine can talk to the power company, then they can look at when people are using their washing and they can start to talk to the aircon company to say, well, why don't you just turn your aircon off for half an hour when the washing machine's heating up the water? Because then we can balance supply and we don't need to use the really dirty electricity. You know, these are quite useful use cases for, for, for saving um, CO2, for example, but they require that pooling of data. And then you have the problem and, you know, five years ago, everyone was like, oh, big data, we're going to take everything out of our business, all the unstructured data, all the structured data, we're going to shove it somewhere and we're going to start to analyze it and hire statisticians to analyze it. And what quickly realized there's some really interesting stuff came out, but that actually you can't do the analysis on scale. So you ended up with, you could find really interesting things out, but you can't systematize the analysis. And what I think is really interesting today is that the growth of AI or the conversation we're having around AI, I think emerges out of that. It's around the fact we've got now vast pools of data. We've got computing capability that can kind of run these probabilistic fuzzy algorithms on that data. And therefore we can start to systematize the discovery of stuff. We can start to make applications that, that, deal with the mess and therefore bring the data sources together in a, in a really useful way and start to produce much more innovative, productive solutions. And for me, that's the kind of key of, of AI that, you know, thinking about AI as, uh, uh, as an isolation from the ecosystem of, of the data, which is plugged together perhaps beyond your organization to other organizations, you know, on a, a very basic level, my, nest thermostat talking to the weather service so that it can kind of correlate my heating is a very obvious example but why wouldn't we go further than that why wouldn't we look at other data sources why wouldn't we be wanting to pull and learn from the the patterns of usage of our devices across a community or in different areas or with different other businesses and putting them together and we couldn't really do that before we had something that could systematize the analysis and that that for me is why i think ai is interesting not because it's amazing and new, it's a lot of it is a 30 year old algorithms, but <laughs> without the cloud and without this data, we couldn't have done stuff um, and we wouldn't have needed it either. This is what, what's interesting to me because we've, you know, we're, we're, we, I want to keep coming back to innovation, mm. right? And we talk about access to infrastructure and, and computing capacity, but what you're really saying is that the, there's a new wave of, of access to resource you know, which is data. We're, we're, mm -hmm. you're, you're actually describing data as a commodity resource as much, you know, in, as we would have thought of coal maybe in the, in the, in the past driving, you know, steam and a steam revolution. Um, data is potentially driving a whole new set of, of innovations that we, you know, we can sort of oh. imagine. Yeah. We sort of started with advertising, right? We started, you know, the advertising industry has been transformed by data that Facebook sells you as a commodity. You're a product that Facebook sells, right. but the reason it can sell you at a higher value than a kind of TV company on the old school broadcasts is because it can add value to you by having a very clear idea of who you are and what you do and what you like. And therefore it can sell you to someone who knows that you're interested in a particular thing at a higher value than it could sell a kind of broadcast world where you're one of 20 million and we don't know which one of you is interested in this thing. So data created new value, absolutely created new value in the Facebook or Google ecosystems for advertising. Um, and that's just one example. If you start looking at data beyond that, it, it, it's central to the value proposition of lots of businesses. And we, 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 we just haven't quite realized that in the same way, like you say, as natural resources used to be. So, so how, how does a business which is used to taking a 10 or 15 year engineering approach to building a product, right, look at building something where half of what they're going to build is going to be shaped by the data that it collects or data they're already collecting or adjacent data that they need to license, plus the software innovation time, plus the you know, infrastructure access they need to deliver the product. Um, of course, the users have to want to 
consume it and, and monetize it, but I, it feels it, it feels overwhelming to me. I think you you're right. I was, it was interesting. We had um, Eric Rise at the LSE last week or the week before last, and I was what? chatting to him, um, and he's just got a new book out for people who. Uh, for people Sorry. who haven't read his book, Lean Startup is this sort of cornerstone, but he's been doing stuff since. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, his new book is The Startup Way, and it actually looks at that because what happened after, you know, he moved away from startups and started because lots of big corporates called him in. So he be, he's been looking at how do you apply the startup idea inside old school engineering companies. And I think he worked a lot with GE, which is kind of traditional old school engineering. And it was just exactly what you were talking about. It's how do you take advantage of new ways of innovating. And particularly what I really like about Eric's work is that it's focused on learning. It's focused on getting data, trying something out in the small scale, and then learning about it and shifting. I mean, the whole idea of Pivot was essentially to learn, to have a kind of cycle of learning. Um, and building in for large organizations or traditional organizations, that sense of, of learning and, and experimentation. And then using new technology, you know, when it's 3D printing to prototype some new thing before and then just talking to people about it or exploring it, um, or whether it's implying in putting sensors into the old school system, you can start to learn from it. So um, yesterday I was at an event talking with a guy from Pirelli Tires and he was talking, you know, you, you have a, the, the, the machines that make tires, they're pretty old school. They're kind of, they have a 15 year lifespan. It's like a big me metal press that presses out and heats up a big piece of rubber. And he was saying that you have to go around and you have to fit new sensors to these old machines. And then you look from the data from the sensors and you start to see what can we change and what can't we change? What can we learn and how can we, how can we apply that? So I think a lot of these old school technology, it is going to be adding technology to them. But um, another company, another area that, that suffers from this is the car industry. So, you know, you look at a, a, a kind of top end car, what is a, I won't name any car companies, but what is a top end European car? It's essentially, it's a internal combustion engine, thousands and thousands of highly tuned parts. It's a big metal cage. And it's a five year out of date entertainment system that everyone goes, well, yeah, it's kind of okay, but it's not as good as my phone. And part of the reason for that is that, that they have different innovation cycles. They, the thing needs to work. It needs to work in minus 30. It needs to work in plus 50. It needs to survive for a long time. You keep your car a long time. Um, and the entertainment system in it has to fit within that but they really struggle to keep the, the two areas or the multiple areas of the business in, t in check. And what they're really wanting is some kind of component updatable software that fits on top of the, the old school device. Now, Tesla have worked on that pretty well. So Tesla can update their software over the air, um, but then they also struggle because things go wrong and they can't change stuff. And they, we haven't sort of tested that at scale yet, the kind of scale that some of the car industry operates at. So um, it'll be interesting to see, but I think it is, if you can't design it from the ground up like Tesla did, you're starting with a, um, we'd call it an installed base. You're building on an installed base. Well, and with a lot of products, I mean, this is, I know, I know Europe and I, I, I watch, you know, very excitedly because of the environmental component. Um, you know, we design, you know, in the US, we, we get into design for obsolescence very aggressively. Um, and we, you know, we've, we've sort of accepted that products are built and disposed of in a, in a relatively short window of time rather than fixed, upgraded, or changed. Um, and it's, there's reasons for it, right? Apple does a really nice job building a very tightly integrated phone. Um, and it, it's very difficult to take a piece out of that phone and replace it, mm -hmm. um, you know, from including the battery. And, and I know that, um, you know, a lot of people would love to see products that that have a longer lifespan, um, but that requires re re repairability and and being able to to actually you know fix things. And I don't know where the cost balance comes from. Um, it definitely slows down innovation if you are assuming that a car has a ten year life cycle. 
and anything you put in that car is going to have to survive a 10 year a 10 year horizon it's going to take you 3 years at least to put things into that car a, a car with a 2 year lifespan you could pump them out in 6 months right yeah. um i mean the, the consumer end is is interesting i mean a lot of it's it's always i try to do this it, it's always worth remembering that you know the vast majority of the economy is not in the apple phone the, the apple phone is it's a significant thing but um, and similarly the kind of tesla cars these are these are kind of um edge cases i suppose in the sense that the you know which would you prefer an app market or selling washing powder washing powder is a pretty good thing to sell still uh, i'm thinking the kind of industrial machines if you look at you know look around at your area there's going to be lots and lots of i don't know their wind farm maybe there'll be industrial plants that are full of machines there's a lot of machines that last a long time you look at your water meter you look at your cooker downstairs you, you kind of don't want a cooker that needs changing every or a water boiler for your house that needs changing every two years just because of the faff of getting the thing changed so there is a lot of devices that i think have to be designed in that way and then the other thing to remember is the market you know, iPhone sucks up all the profit from the mobile phone market, but it's a small part of the mobile phone market. If you look at Africa and South America and China in comparison to other, other areas. So it's just worth having a global perspective a little bit more that, you know, no one's going to go out into in the middle of Siberia to, to install a, I don't know, a new generator for the local village just because it's designed to be obsolescent after two years. It, but there is a lot of industrial machinery that needs to last a lot longer than that. And what we really need to do is modulize. We need to have modular components that can be updated for those bits and other bits that remain the same. same you know, the, the, and, and that's actually where I think, and I get excited about some of the edge technologies and sensors and things like that, because one of the ways to make things more modular, but also have better longevity is to have better control loops, right? Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, people love to think back to the, you know, the, the old the way we used to design machines um, and they were, you know, designed to work forever and they were very durable. Um, but in a lot of cases we did that because the, we didn't actually design them very well. They were way over designed. They had, you know, you know, a lot more steel in them than they needed. They had a lot more power than was required, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they didn't have any feedback sensors to not drive the motor, you know, into a burnout mm. cycle. Um, the Victorians, I mean, they were so, you know, they, they were taken advantage of. They built stuff at huge cost with huge amounts of labor that's still standing around in London. And thanks to them, you know, we could enjoy them. But you're, you know, you're spot on there. And I don't know if you looked at the stuff Autodesk are doing on generative design, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. So, um, the, the idea is that you you don't just design once you design a, a kind of very basic thing so maybe you make a really basic chassis you cover it with sensors then you feed that into some ai or some algorithm in order to come up with a a design that actually only has the components that are needed so you only have the struts that are needed where the stresses actually are while you're driving the car and they come up with these weird you know organic designs but because of 3d printing and additive manufacturing we can actually make them now so you're not as constrained by it but you're not putting in any wasted material and you're still designing something that meets all the design constraints and will last because it fits those design needs so it's not a, a lot of this is about getting that data and the edge case stuff the, the the edge stuff of the sensors can can provide the data to better design these bits and a lot of the work in um in sensor design and IoT has actually been about things like um, predictive maintenance. Um, you know, look at the Rolls Royce stuff where um, engine, you know, the Rolls Royce um, aero engines are constantly communicating back to the sensor so from the aeroplane so that they can predict what maintenance will be need, need to be done before it starts to be a problem. And you can start to therefore reduce the maintenance cost and reduce the overall cost. And then as Rolls Royce do, you can just sell propulsion by the hour because they have, they understand the risk. So why do you buy a, why do you buy a jet engine rather than just hiring the propulsion and then let Rolls Royce deal with what and how they fit the engine, how they maintain the engine, how they look after the engine, because they've got the data to know the, the usage pattern. 
Yeah, so, so micro, ex, micro expertise and then pulling together, uh, sir, you know, those are, that's redefining what service offerings are, where you can actually fully integrate a product and still treat it as a service component. Um, yeah. That's, that's a really interesting hybrid. I, I want to take, before, before we run out of time, I did want to go back to the cargo cult comments since I promised to. Yeah, um, go on. That is. So, so part of the thing that is interesting in these innovation cycles and, and the real work of building product, um, mm -hmm. which takes time and expertise, right? The, the Rolls Royce example is great because Rolls Royce didn't just pop up overnight and say, oh, I'm going to design a better engine. Right? It's, it's decades, centuries of yeah. experience that goes into this. Um, one of the things that we see in, in communities and in open source communities is a bit of one or two celebrity um, developers, engineers, people saying, oh, I have a better way to do this, popping up and saying, you know, and because of their, no, their notoriety, they can basically um, plant a flag in something and pull a whole bunch of eyeballs and attraction into uh, an idea that they don't really have that much history building, um, it, which is sort of this cargo cult. This person's like, all right, I'm going to fix it. And you are, know, well, that person's really smart. They're going to fix it. Um, sometimes that works out really well, but sometimes it, it, it translates into a huge stampeding rush um, of people into, you know, over into one thing. Um, and then they, they all sort of show up and they're like, wow, that was a lot harder than I thought. That's, that's the phrase that, um, you know, well, that was, that was, that was a hard problem. We, we, we didn't solve it in a weekend of, of frenetic coding. Um, mm -hmm. do you, is that something you track in, you know, do you watch that? Is that something you sort of have a longer, longer perspective in? I, no, other than I, I'll say what I do in my, so in my lectures, I, 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 I talk about things like, um, I don't know if you remember ACID transactions when you did uh -huh. database management, you know, back in the day, you know, you have to learn I around the current, the, uh, idempotent and distributed, I think. Uh, yeah, it's asymptomicity, consistency, isolation and durability to make sure ah, essentially yeah. that a transaction runs. Don't worry, I'm looking them up on Google. Um, <laughs> You know, you have to make sure that a transaction fully runs, completely runs, doesn't half run, doesn't take the money from your bank account and lose it in the middle of the transaction. And this is the kind of old school database design stuff. Right. And I teach that not because my students necessarily need to know it, but because until you hear about it, you think you never think about those issues. It's really easy to think about our oh, design a right to a database or to a file or I'll do some transactional thing without actually thinking about the side effects and about all those specific issues. And I try just to say, look, it isn't, you know, it, writing good software isn't just about having exposed brickwork and a foosball machine, a foosball <laughs> table. It's about actually consistently understanding the limitations of what you can do. And I think, you know, writing simple apps because of the frameworks that are available, you know, producing simple web page web page sites very very easy really easy scripting really easy stuff to do and all the complicated stuff is handled at the back end by the frameworks what worries me is when people then think because they can do that they can write things that have the complexity of the framework and are dealing with real life problems you know i wouldn't want to climb into an airplane or have my healthcare data looked after by something that was written by someone who didn't understand those hardcore software engineering issues which goes back to my the reason software engineering books are two inches thick is because this stuff is is difficult nobody's saying we need to go back to the life cycle nobody's saying we need to go back to doing all of the stuff but there is still a big role for program verification for hardcore testing approaches for kind of understanding those approaches and then also remembering that agile came out of a bunch of guys who wanted to produce quality software you know go back and read the agile manifesto it wasn't about hacking and and quick and dirty it was about getting away from quick and dirty and getting into robust software engineering that wasn't taking the life cycle slower specification led approach but also wasn't just hacking it was about kind of quality understanding and extreme programming is a great example of that you know extreme programming focused on test first 
pair programming. You know, these were ideas that were brought together because they increased the quality and refactoring as well that, that kept simple code that was really quality code. And it, it does worry me that we see, and we see huge examples of it, the kind of devices that are being sold that you plug into your house, a Wi-Fi system, and then expose your data to who knows what, because someone didn't understand and think about the security implications. And it, we've all seen all these security issues popping up. And I think they're kind of thin end of a, a, a very big wedge of, of poor quality code with poor quality software engineering and computer science skills um, are writ large. Now it's not just the, the, often those individuals are really good. I mean, I'm not criticizing those kind of star individuals. It's not, it's it's not the individual, problem. it's not, right. But it's, well, it, it can be a big problem. I think it's because we abstract, we abstract so much away. Yeah. That everything's abstracted. And I mean, I know in the good old days when I did computer science, we did uh, machine language and yeah. we had to learn how to actually convert it and everything. And now if you go to computer science school, I don't even think they bother. And, and you don't understand the basics. But well, I have to be the, well, I'll let you finish Rob, but I have to be the bad guy. You know how I am. I know, I know we're out of time. Um, and, and I think this, it's a whole nother topic. I, I, I think, I don't think we have to force people to program in punch cards and assembly um, no. to, to, to teach good engineering practices. Um, I, I do think it's very easy to uh, show an 80% solution, right? And think that you've, you've, you've solved, you've solved yeah. the harder parts of those problems, right? I think the thing we forget, and this is where the cargo cult comes back to me, it's right where you can, you can sort of say, wow, I solved this, this problem with this new platform and we've, you know, it's this new huge thing and, and they've solved the sort of the, you know, the low hanging fruit has come out of it. Yeah. Um, but the, what you're describing, you know, these, these, you know, the, the 20%, which is really the 80% work of dealing with security and the deployment and the implementation and, you know, quality and, and but you know, those things are, are, are really very difficult to rush. And can um, I just add, I know you're out of time, but I just that the social science skills of understanding what market you're really attacking and making sure you don't mess up on things like, you know, uh, Google did that drop mic April 1st joke. Do you remember that on the Gmail? And basically, if you, you gave a second button on Gmail that said send with a YouTube video of someone dropping a mic, not realizing that lots of people were using Gmail for their commercial email and sort of damaging customer relationships. It's like if a company with the resources of Google can fail to understand its products properly because of the social science side, I think that that's a big side of it as well. Just businesses understanding that there's a glo whole globe out there with different agendas and different cultures um, and imposing that in design. We're definitely taking some of the breaks off of things. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, this well, has been fascinating. Um, love going deep and broad. So it's been really good. And, Thank and you. I really enjoyed it. And, um, I, yeah. I, I think this is great. Uh, so, Will, just if people are interested in, uh, you know, following up, learning more about what you're working on and stuff, I know you have a website, Will Venters, W I L L V E N T E R S dot com. Um, any other places they should go? I guess you have Twitter. I'm sure you have to have Twitter, right? Isn't that the law? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm cloudy grid. It was a terrible what? title back in the day. I was looking at grid and cloud computing. So I'm at cloudy grids on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn and um, I have a blog binary blurring.com, which is where I put sort of various interesting things. Um, so that's a, a, a place to find me. But otherwise just, Search for Venters at the LSE and you should find quite a bit. And, and thank you again for joining us and to our listeners. Um, I hope you found this really interesting. We're working to find different viewpoints. And certainly I think today's discussion was not our typical discussion, Rob. I, I really enjoyed it. And, and maybe in a couple of months, maybe five, six months, uh, we'll, we'll come back and, and talk again. And by that time, the world will have changed so much <laughs> in technology because I don't know how anyone keeps check. Every three months, something new comes. Uh, you know, we'll be talking about AI machines programming AI or something. But uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. And I'll speak to you in a few months then. Okay. Great.